Hi, Bob. Good. Thank Welcome. You. Thank you very much for being here, Bob. I really appreciate for you taking the time. Let me introduce you to Professor Michael McCarthy from Harvard University, Dr. Tessa Misiasek from Harvard University, and Jack Kelly from Forbes Magazine. Nice to see you all. Well, good morning. Thank you. Now, what, should, Dr. Langer, what would you... What, Bob. What would you Bob? Bob? I'm very, I'm very simple. Yeah, just Bob. <laughs> Bob, well, thank you so much for coming on Happy at work. And basically, I'm not sure how much Alessandra shared with you. It's really about sharing positivity in the workforce, empowering workers, making them happier. And um, with everything you've done, I mean, you, you, you founded not only Moderna, all these other companies, wanted to get your insights into how you are a leader, especially during these difficult times. So maybe we'll kick it off. And, and Mike, you could... Um, kind of chat, you know, ask some questions to Bob. Sure. Actually, Bob, we, we know we have limited time. And so we've numbered how we're going to order our questions. And Tessa's got my favorite question. So I'm going to give up my time and ask her to start us off. And I'll go no. second. <laughs> Tessa, Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and, and hi, Dr. Langer, or hi, Bob. I actually met you 20 years ago. Um, you gave, I was working in the development office at Mass General Hospital, and I was uh, fundraising for Dr. Crowley. You gave us a tour oh. of your lab at MIT. So for me, this is a very much a full circle moment 20 years later <laughs> to talk wow. to you. Um, my first question for you is, you know, we, as we have navigated through the pandemic and Moderna has played obviously a pivotal role in, in bringing everyone back to work. And one question we had was, how have you as a CEO of a company, beyond the fact that you've had this in, enormous impact on the global pandemic with the vaccine, but how has Moderna as a company dealt with the pandemic and everyone returning back to work, whether it's those who work in the sales function and the operations function and supply chain? How, how has the culture been at Moderna as you return back to work um, after, the, after the pandemic is, is resolving? Sure. Well, well, I'm I'm on the I'm a founder of Moderna and on the board of directors. Of, I'm not the CEO, but you ask a good question. And the CEO, I mean, and 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 like Stefan Bonsell, I think I think what you know what people feel at the company, and it's certainly something I believe in as well, is they they have been working on something, and they work night and day, and have been right through the pandemic because of the importance of what they're doing. I mean, everybody I think feels that that this is such a terrible crisis. And they know that the science they're doing, the manufacturing they're doing, the clinical work they're doing, you know, it's just so important for, for literally billions of people. And I think it's that understanding and that motivation that you're doing something just so important that gets people motivated and it's motivated them right through the pandemic. Obviously different people, you know, different people have different functions. So some people have, have worked remotely and, but uh, you know, but I think the key has been when you're doing something that that's just that you believe in, you know, that, that carries the day by far over anything else. You know, Bob, what you're mentioning is a lot from uh, positive psychology. We talk about uh, meaning and purpose and that's what gets people motivated. And so many people now with a great resignation aren't as motivated because they're starting to look at their lives again and say, you know, there isn't a, a lot of meaning and purpose in what I'm doing, but saving the world, which is pretty much what you've been doing, is a great motivator. So I think you're fortunate in that. My question for you is, and this is for other people also watching this show, we all have so many distractions, you know, the electronics, the screens, everyone's going for our attention. You know, and everyone's trying to grab you for your time as well. How do you stay focused when you just have so many people poking at you? Now, it's a good question. I, I have a great group of people helping me, you know, in my office and in the lab and in the companies that I'm working with. So, you know, you just do the best you can. I'm a pretty hard worker, so I'm working seven days a week and, you know, often uh, many evenings as well. But actually, one thing that, and I do go into the lab, you know, now several days a week, but I, I would say one thing that actually, even in this world, you know, that I haven't done very much, which I used to do is get on airplanes and fly and that, and not flying saves so much time. I mean, it's just unbelievable, you know, like, I don't know how many lectures I've given, you know, even the last week or two to Singapore, to, to, to uh, Taiwan, to India, 
you know, I mean, all over the way, you know, people normally would want you to fly there, which mm -hmm. then I might not do, but, you know, I've done it sometimes. And, you know, so I, I've saved so much time by uh, not getting on airplanes and that that's really freed up a lot of time for me to, to do, to do things. So that to me has been one of the benefits of, of, of this. Now, obviously zoom types of things are not as personal as, mm -hmm. you know, being there, but, Still, I feel like when I look at the question you're asking, it's like what I, I'm able to to do much more because I'm not wasting time on airplanes that are late all the time. And, you know, and, 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 and even if they weren't late, you know, the overseas travel is, you know, takes a lot out of you. And um, and, and when I fly, by the way, I, I usually would fly it like I always tell the story when I would have to go to well, let's say I'll just pick Israel you know, because they have a 1 a.m. flight, I would I would not use hotels. I would just fly over, you know, do whatever I was going to do and then get on the 1 a.m. flight and fly, get back to Boston. Wait, how, how do you how are you not tired doing that? I'm, I'm a little younger than you are and I'd be exhausted. Yeah, I, 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 I was, to get the energy. Well, I, I do get tired. I, you know, I do get tired, but I try to make that the day when I got get back for that. Not quite as bad as normal. And, uh, you know, at least I don't, you know, but I, I, you, you sort of just get used to it, you know. Right, now, I, now are, are you a big shot now that, so, so you're, you're now, you have your own private jet and you're sipping champagne or how is it, or is the same, you're the same person you were? Yeah, I don't think, I don't think anything's changed much. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, but other than, like I say, that I don't fly rather, you know, so I, I, I mean, I, I haven't done any of that. I haven't, uh, I think the last major flight I had was February of, uh, of 2020, you know, I just, uh, um, but I, you know, but I, I think in a, a zoom world, you have, uh, you know, you just have more time to, like I say, give lectures, do meetings and things like that. That being said, like I say, I, I really did for a while miss, I mean, now I'm going back into the lab, but I'd miss talking to the students one on one. And I think that's always, you know, a very important thing for me. Not, not to be too personal, but, you, you know, it's almost and I don't mean to exaggerate the situation, but it's almost like a superhero movie where you and your team are trying to come up with this vaccine, this antidote. The whole world is watching. The pressure is on. How, how did you guys cope? Because that seems like it could easily disintegrate within the company where people just get, you know, so worried, so anxious. How did it go? How did, how was it behind the scenes? Well, again, I, if we're talking about Moderna, yeah, what, yeah. I, what I feel is that there I give the management team, you know, uh, tr tremendous credit. I mean, the people, you know, Stefan Von Sell, Stephen Ho, you know, Juan Andres, Melissa Moore. I mean, the team, it's been super dedicated and they, like I say, they, I mean, I do worry about that. I do worry about them, but they have put, you know, they have put this first uh, because they feel it's really important and they're just, they're just great human beings. But I agree. I were, I do worry about like the press has always been critical. I mean, the press has always been critical of me or often been critical of me. They certainly have been critical of Moderna. I mean, I think it's just comes with the territory, you know, but uh uh, you know, which is sad. I mean, I, I feel like, uh, what was it the Na Na National Bureau of Economic Research said the press is right, 91% of the stories in the US are negative and uh, on, on the vaccine, which is, is unfortunate. And, uh, but I, you know, but I think people just, they believe in what they're doing. So they keep doing, you know, so the people at Moderna have just done a terrific job. I mean, they're just great human beings as well as great scientists. So is that because they believe so, so strongly what they're doing that it doesn't matter? They could tune out all the distractions. They could tune out all the noise because they're so passionate about it. And uh, by having good leaders, they're able to keep them hyper-focused and looking at the mission at hand. Is that how it works out? I don't think you can tune it out. I don't yeah. think anybody is able to tune things out. I mean, I, I, I wish that would be the case. I mean, you have protesters going to the CEO's house, you know, when his wife's there all alone and kids and, you know, and, and I don't think you can tune stuff like that out. Um, but I think the rest of what you said is right. I think that, that, that he and everybody at the, at, at the company just really believes that, and, and, and they're correct that what they're doing is just really important and, and will save a lot of lives. So that's why they do it. 
So Bob, when Tessa and I were teaching the positive workplace at, at Harvard's professional development, we had the good fortune of having some people for the CDC that came and we asked them, why are you here? And they said, it's the first time that we've ever had people not believing what we're telling the public. And we're starting to have the feeling of why bother? If people aren't gonna receive our hard work well, why bother? And it was demotivating. And I could see that coming across the negative press. Is there anything that you say to the team to keep them resilient when you get this negative press and it drags people down? Do you say anything to help them with coping mechanisms to not let the press drag you down? Well, I, th- I mean, again, as a director of the company, you know, when I when I talk to some of the people and I also go over to help sometimes scientifically, I'm on the scientific advisory board and I collaborate with some of the, or not collaborate, but I, you know, give advice to some of the scientists, some of whom are my own former students. I, I've i always, I mean, I, I try to just say what I believe, which is that they're doing an incredible job and I really appreciate it. And and I think, you know, I, I, my, my model actually for what I've done in the lab and what I would do there, and it's because I believe in it, is what I would call positive reinforcement. You know, it's what I learned from my postdoctoral advisor, Judah Folkman, who was uh, at Harvard Medical School. And, you know, he would always look on, on the positives rather than the negatives. And I certainly understand the CDC comment, but I feel you can... You know, I always try to believe that 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 there's there are some silver linings in everything, and that you want to let people know just how much you appreciate the incredible hard work they're doing, and that what they're doing will, you know, make a huge difference in people's health in the world. Thank you. One question I I had in follow up to that: um, you've talked a lot about being able to to manage your team and that positive reinforcement that really keeps people resilient and encouraged in their work. You've had such an incredibly prolific career. How have, um, what are some things that you do to avoid burnout? Um, and, and of course you might've had moments where you did experience burnout, but um, whether it's exercise or meditation or what practices, what things do you do in your daily life to uh, stay productive and, and to try to avoid um, you know, being too stressed and, and burning out? Yeah, well, that's an interesting question. You know, so early in my career, I got an enormous amount of rejections. You know, my first nine grants were rejected. I couldn't get a faculty job and in, uh, in chemical engineering, which was my discipline. And then when I finally got a job in a nutrition department, they wanted to fire me. But that, that was a long time ago. And and I and maybe living through that, you know, makes me stronger today. Uh, but uh, but I I um, and certainly I got used to criticism and, and, and rejection and stuff like that because of those things. I, today, you know, I mean, I, I do what you, you, what you said. I exercise a tremendous amount. I, I would like to tell you I do it to relieve stress. I, I major reason I think I do it is because I, you know, my dad died of a heart, heart attack when he was 61. I'm now 73. And, and also I do it because I love to eat, you know, so I, I love good food. So I feel like and, and I'm not very good at the pushing the food away <laughs> exercise. So I do the other exercise, but I probably run, you know, 10, 12 miles a day and, or, or well run and walk. I don't want to over credit myself and, 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 and lift weights a few days a week. So I, I do do a lot of exercise. So if anything, it's, 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 it's probably that, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know that there's anything else. I, but, so I do spend quite a bit of time on exercise and I try to do it every day. And along those same lines, can I ask about how do you balance family um, with being so productive again in your work and having a thriving career? We have um, our students that we teach at, at Harvard and at Holt International Business School, I think, think about having these really demanding, thriving careers, but also at the same time, you know, certainly younger generations appreciate work-life balance and having family. How have you been able to balance that? Yeah, well, I have to give my wife credit for that. My wife went to Harvard, and when we got married and had, and then especially when we had children, I mean, she's got a PhD from MIT too, so she understands like academic life, which is my main, you know, still my main thing. You know, it's uh, you know, running running the lab and, and and doing it. But she said when we had the kids, you know, she said if you need to travel, of course, I want you know you 
to do that. But she said, when you're here, I'd like you to be home every night by seven so you can spend time with the children. And I, I always listen to what she says. So I think, and, and, and she's also a very good communicator. That's actually very important. You know, she always, I always know where I stand with her. So if I did something that she didn't like, she absolutely would let me know. And I think good communication is just so critical, you know, and she's a far better communicator than I am. But I think um, that that really helped. And I, you know, would do that. And I love spending time with the children. I'd also, one of the things I did when, um, you know, as they got a little bit older, like say seven or eight, every, you know, I when I did travel, uh, I would take each of them on a trip every year. You know, in the beginning, they were kind of simple trips like New York City and things like that when I had to give a lecture. But as, you know, but I, as they got older, I mean, I got asked to go overseas a lot. And I have, I have good, good thing is I have students who are professors or friends, all these places too. So if I was super busy, they would spend time or, you know, with, with, with the kids or that some of them might have had kids and, and spend time with them. But, you know, and, and the really nice thing is now my kids are 27, 30 and 32, and they still like to do those trips, <laughs> you know? So I, I feel uh, very, very lucky. Of course, the trips now are like to Italy or Israel and other places, but, uh, but I, but, but that those, and I would always do it one-on-one, -on -one, which I think really, made a difference. So they, you know, because I, three kids, because they, they, when you're doing that, they would feel comfortable saying things to me that they wouldn't in front of maybe everybody else. And, and it, you wouldn't predict when they would say it, but they, they just would, you know, so that, that was another thing that, that I've done and I guess I'm still doing. So uh, as, as hopefully COVID gets back to uh, the world gets back to normal. Bob, I'm sure everyone else is thinking this, but I'm going to be weird enough to ask, how do you stay like, you seem like such a nice, humble guy. And with the success you've done, I would be an egomaniac. How do you like? How do you, how do you like? How do you just stay grounded? Is it your wife and kids that just kind of keep you aligned? How do you just keep a level head? Well, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure my <laughs> wife and kids do do that. But I mean, it's like I, I think you're born a certain way. I don't yeah. know. My parents, I think, you know, I probably have to give to whatever I am, good or bad. I probably have to give my parents credit for that you know that they, they uh you know I, I so i i but but my wife is very good at at, at like i say letting me know where i stand she always <laughs> lets me you know people ask sometimes her that question she said well bob always knows that i'm smarter than he is <laughs> like it sounds very it familiar the harvard education of hers <laughs> uh, I, I hear that a lot so I, I i understand i know where you're coming from on that so, Bob, I'm going to pivot us to your students. And you know, we're, all, we're all teachers here. And um, what I'm hearing from a lot of CEOs uh, out in industry now is that the, the students coming out of schools today don't have the right skills. And I'm curious, what skills do you think people need that they, they don't have? And just in general, skills that you think people need to be successful going forward with the way the world is right now. What do they need to focus on? Yeah, well, that's a very interesting question for which I don't think there's a simple answer because there's, I think you need many different skills. And of course, people make contributions in many different ways. Um, you know, when I look at uh, academic skills, you know, I think uh, the type of thing that we do at MIT, I think people need to be bright. They need to work very hard. Um, I think that personally, I'm, I'm, a risk taker, you know, I believe that you, it's good if you're choosing projects to work on what I'll call high risk, high reward projects, you know, which, which can make a big difference. And, 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 and in so doing, recognize that failure is okay. You know, I think that one of the things that really has uh, made the United States companies do very well is, is that, uh, is, I think that, that, that kind of attitude. And I don't mean just for me or the students, but you look at, 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 at a lot of these people who have been very successful CEOs. I mean, they have taken all big chances, but they're, but they're willing to fail. And of course we read about the ones that have succeeded and, and you can succeed, you know, big time. I, I also feel, um, and, and a lot of people might disagree with this, you know, but I, I personally feel like for so many things that I'm involved in, I, I really, want people to, and this is going to sound simplistic, be just nice, good human beings. You know, I don't know that that's key for success, but I think it's just so important um, 
you know, if you're working in a, in a, in a group, you know, to be a, a good person and considerate of, of other people. Certainly it's something I think about a lot for our, our, our lab group and, you know, which I'm, I'm very proud of the people at MIT who are graduate students, postdocs and undergraduates who work in, in our lab. Um, so I, but, but I also think that uh, another thing that I think is it very important might be, uh, I'm trying to think how to phrase this, is creativity and, and the kind of questions you ask. I think that, that people having enough self-confidence to ask really you know, big transformative questions um, rather than say things that are incremental. I mean, well, I think that certainly when I look at science, that's a very important thing. And I would think that that's gonna be important in whatever area uh, that somebody pursues. So a lot of those things maybe blend together, but uh, but those are so, those are certainly some of the skills that that I think are are important that are maybe not the most obvious ones. Well, a, a follow up. So, sorry about that. A follow up to that though, um, Bob is as far as um, what you said around being able to take risks and you know big risk, big reward, um, but being okay with failure. Do you feel that? the American school system and that the infrastructures that we have in place really do help provide a uh, support for taking those kinds of risks and in teaching kids that failure is okay. Um, do you feel like companies in general are doing a good job at allowing people to, to really take those risks and, and fail? Or do you feel like, you know, it's seen more in academia, but we need to do a better job on the, on the corporate side? Yeah, well, that's a really interesting question because I mean, it really gets to the heart of wh wh why is it that people like a Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or an Elon Musk or Stefan Bonsell, like if I pick Moderna, you know, uh, or Nubar, you know, people like that, why do they take those risks? I don't think, it, I, I, I actually don't think it comes from the schools. I mean, I, I wish our, you know, I wish education uh, was more highly valued, um, but I, you know, I'm not sure that it is. Um, so I, and I, and I think companies, as they get bigger, they also, I think, you know, really it's harder to take risks at a, at a bigger company than a smaller company, just because of there's more people that can say no, there's more infrastructure. So where it comes from, that's a great question. I mean, I think part of maybe it comes from role models, you know, that people can see uh, people that have done this and they've met people, like I say, for me, uh, having worked with Judah Folkman, who was definitely took risks and was a great surgeon, a great scientist that, you know, that made a huge difference in my life. And, uh, you know, so I, I, it may just be part of the American culture, but I, I, I actually don't know the answer to that uh, beyond, beyond the things that I just said. But I don't think it's the schools. I wish the schools and the companies would do a, a better job. Small companies, I think, often do, yeah. and, uh, but the big companies, it's just harder because of the infrastructure. Speaking of taking, you know, asking big questions, do you have something planned next? Do you have something that's getting you excited, a new company, a new idea, a new project in the works? Well, we always have, 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 have new, new, new things. Uh, so I guess what I'd say is one of the things that I've been excited about our lab and, and, and it has and will lead to companies or work we're doing with the, that we're, which is funded by Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation. So for the last nine or 10 years, you know, we, we've had quite a bit of funding from the Gates Foundation and, and Bill personally has been involved in terms of creating new delivery systems for pills, uh, you know, that you could make pills last for a week or a month or, or maybe even a year which would improve patient compliance. We're also working, have been working on, and not, not be, and we started this well before COVID, work on what I'll call self-boosting vaccines. These would be uh, like a way to give a single injection, and yet you might get like 11 boosters or 12 boosters with that single injection. We've come up with a new printing approach to develop these systems. Um, and, uh, and then new ways of giving nutrition. You know, there's about 2 billion people that are um, malnourished and, uh, you know, and, and, and so uh, we've come up with ways of delivering, uh, again, different unstable nutrients to help them, uh, you know, different vitamins, probiotics and so forth. And, and, and we are, have started companies on, on, on some of these areas and, and I'm sure we'll start more. I mean, again, the beauty of these startup companies is that they can 
uh, they, they are taking risks, but they can have a giant impact on, on, on the world and make products that can you know, affect you know, billions of people. So Someday. Bob, as we, as we close up on the interview, um, I'd like to just throw this question out and see if you'd like to, uh, like to answer it or not. So I'll give you the invitation. Is, it's gotta be really frustrating that you've made this vaccine and there are some people who for various reasons you know, are hesitant and don't wanna, don't wanna take it. If you could talk to those people directly, what would you want them to know to encourage them to feel comfortable about what you've created? Is there anything you'd like to say to them? Well, I mean, like I say, it's not just me. It's it's everybody at Moderna. I don't want to overgive myself that much credit because it's so many people have made the contribution, and I, I like I said, I've just helped get the company started. And and uh, but what I would say, and what I do say when I talk to people is, I mean, first you should look at the data. You know, the data I think is pretty clear that uh, that the benefits just so so far outweigh the risks. The second thing is to look at the science. You know, in other words, some people seem to think that, you know, that it's, you know, that it's somehow going to integrate into your DNA and or, or things like that, which it, it doesn't do. The messenger RNA vaccines, you know, that they they are, are aimed to, so that your body will make a vaccine against the spike protein, and then the messenger RNA is gone. Uh, you know, there's no scientific reason why it's going to um, why it should have a bad effect. And in fact, when you look at now the fact that hundreds of millions of people or more have been vaccinated, I mean, you know, any side effects have been unbelievably rare. So I think it's really those two things, looking at the human data, looking at, uh, at, at, at the scientific principles. I mean, I think that's all you can say. And then you have to also look at, of course, at what happens, sadly, to the people that don't have the vaccine. You know, when you look at all the deaths, I mean, what is there, 11, 12 times the number of deaths in, in a year and a half in the United States as we had in the entire Vietnam War. I mean, it's just staggering. I mean, you know, the not, and, and, and it's not only the deaths, it's the long-term effects of COVID. And, um, you know, I know it's, it's interesting. I, when I went in for a booster shot, um, uh, you know, at, 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 must have been a few weeks ago or whatever. And one of the, the woman who was giving me the shot, she said, yeah, you know, several people in her class, even though they were young, you know, were had, had to use a walker, you know, now and, and, and things like, so in other words, the long term, the effects of COVID are, you know, they, for, even when people survive, they don't necessarily go away. Long-term COVID effects are, are terrible. So I, I think people should, should, should realize that. And, and I think, you know, I, I also feel like, like you say, the news media, uh, some of the news media, some are, I think are very good, but it would be good if they emphasize those things rather than, you know, trying to stir up controversy all the time. Thank you. Jack, do you want to finish this up? Yeah, that's, you know, we want to be respectful of your time, Bob, and I really appreciate all the advice, everything you've given us. Any, anything that maybe we didn't ask that for the, let's say for the readers of Forbes and for the students of Mike and Tessa that we didn't ask that you'd kind of like to share? Well, I, I just would want to emphasize, you know, which just sounds like you're already there, but, you know, but, but I think as a, somebody who runs a lab, you know, and you work with young people, I, I guess, you know, there's several ways, you know, sometimes people would ask me, how do you get people to work harder? You know, do you tell them they have to work harder? And my message always is I want people to work hard because they want to, not because they have to, because they believe that what they're doing is something that's really important. And, 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 I, and it sounds to me like that's also what you're all advocating. And I just think that's so much of a, you know, so dealing with positive things rather than negative things, which it sounds to me like that's exactly what you're doing. Bob, um, that's exact. It's like, I, you know, I think one of the reasons we gravitated together and, and, and got along is that I don't want to speak for them, but I, it feels that there's so much doom and kind of amplifying what you're saying. There's so much doom and gloom and anger and just stirring up you know, animosity by the media that we want to bring some positivities, you know, want to bring voices like yourself, but we could share, wait, things are good. They, you know, there are very positive things are happening and try to highlight that and counteract just all the negativity that's out there. So yeah, yeah you're absolutely right. It's, it's kind of a, for me personally, that's a big driving force in terms of everything I write about to kind of share actionable advice to people so that 
you know, it counteracts the narrative of like everything being so bad because it's not, this is like, to me, and I don't, I'm curious what you think, Bob, before you head out, it just seems like we're in a pretty exciting time, actually, a, a big time of change, right? I, I, I think that's right. I think this is, uh, you know, I, 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 I think, and I mean, one of the things for me as a scientist that's been very important has been to see that really, if it wasn't for a lot of scientists, you know, I mean, and, and, and it's not just the vaccines, it's new drugs, it's new masks, it's, it's new diagnostics, it's so many things, but scientists have played really, I think, the key role in, in at least, I mean, in saving, you know, countless lives and hopefully getting things back to normal. If we didn't have uh, lots of great scientists all over the world. I mean, who, I, I can only imagine how bad this would have been. Well, thank you. Thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you for everything you've done and your company's done. It's been amazing. And, and uh, it, it was a pleasure meeting you. You know, it's, it's so nice to meet a nice person who's done such great things. <laughs> and I'm not saying to flatter you, I swear to God, I'm not trying to be that guy. I'm just really, you know, it's, 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 it's just, it's nice to see because we all speak to people in our, our works of life who are pretty, you know, well accomplished. And a lot are as nice and humble and giving as you are. So it's a pleasure to see that. It's awesome. It's nice of you to say, but I, I, I and, and but really, it's nice of you to encourage people to 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 in, 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 a, in a good way. So thank you all for that. But thank you very much for coming out. It's it great meeting you. Thanks, Bob. It's thank been you. great. Thank you so much for all the pearls of wisdom that you've given to our students and and the audience. We're grateful for it. Yes, and thank you for your work. Very thank much you. appreciated. Thank, thank you all. Thank, thank you, you very much, Bob. Okay. okay. Thank Take you. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.